Hello everyone, and welcome to the Conrad Caldwell House Museum. While it might look like Christmas here in the dining room, many families are getting ready for a big day of cooking this Thursday for Thanksgiving. So today, we wanted to show you how to add a little Edwardian flair into your Thanksgiving Day meal. Here at the museum, we're fortunate enough to have many items which belong to the Caldwell family who lived in the home between 1906 and 1938. Some of the items in our collection even predate the time they lived here at 1402 St. James Court. Let's take a look at Elaine Caldwell's menu book to get some inspiration for what you can serve this year for Thanksgiving. So here we have Elaine Caldwell's menu book. This little notepad is filled with menus between the years of 1896 and 1902. The menus are from luncheons to birthdays, even for Christmas. But it's the Thanksgiving menus we want to look at today. For the menu from Thanksgiving 1900, there are roughly seven courses, with the third course being the main meal. Mrs. Caldwell served a fairly traditional meal that year, turkey with cranberry sauce, creamed mashed potatoes, and even beaten biscuits. But it's the dressing we want to recreate today, in which she used oysters. In modern day, there seems to be a great divide in regards to oysters. Some love them, some hate them, and some simply refuse to try them. And I admit, I was one of those individuals who refused to try them for many years. Before their craze in the 19th century, oysters as a food source on the North American continent can be traced to the coastal indigenous people, like those of the Lenape tribe, who have been eating them for almost 9,000 years. After Europeans began colonizing the continent, oysters were harvested at an incredible, almost voracious rate. But it was only those who lived near large oyster-producing bodies of water, like Chesapeake Bay, who could indulge on them. This was due to their inability to be preserved for a long period of time once they were out of their shells. All of that was soon to change, however, due to advancements in food preservation and transportation in the 19th century. Railways made it possible to ship oysters further inland, and by the 1840s, oyster canning became a booming business in coastal cities. New ways of harvesting larger quantities and the abundance of oysters also meant that they were incredibly inexpensive, which helped boost their popularity. In 1909, for instance, oysters could cost half as much as beef per pound. They were also a great and inexpensive way to add bulk to dishes and were noted for being one of the greatest delicacies of the world. So now that we, have, so now that we know a little bit more about why oysters were incredibly popular and why they possibly feature so heavily in Mrs. Caldwell's menus, it's time to recreate her 1900 oyster dressing. Let's head to the kitchen. To make authentic Edwardian oyster dressing, I turned to two popular cookery books of the mid to late 1800s. The first is Mrs. Beaton's book of cookery and household management, while the second is the original Fanny Farmer cookbook from 1896. Both books have similar recipes for oyster dressing. Fanny Farmer's is a little simpler, with just mace, salt, and pepper to season, while Mrs. Beaton's uses the same, but with the addition of fresh herbs and an egg. I think I'll use Miss Beaton's version. Since Mrs. Beaton's recipe doesn't specify which fresh herbs to use, I delved a bit further in my research to other popular cookbooks of the time. Dressing or stuffing recipes often called for parsley, chives, and thyme, even a bit of marjoram. Most recipes called for chopped celery or celery leaves, but noted that if you include oysters in your stuffing to omit the celery. The other omission from Mrs. Beaton's is whether or not the oyster dressing is baked. It has an egg, so surely it must be baked. For this conundrum, I'm turning to my friend Brian Cushing, who is a historian and an excellent resource when it comes to things like this. Thanks, Brian. Well, hello, my name is Brian Cushing. I've uh, had the pleasure of being able to research and experiment on foodways from throughout the 19th century. Also love working with the Conrad Caldwell House Museum. And so the other day, Chris called me up and said he was trying to figure out how to make an authentic oyster stuffing uh, for the Thanksgiving dinner that he was recreating from uh, one of the Caldwell family uh, menus. And he was working with a, a recipe from Mrs. Beaton and it was short on some details. He was pretty sure that he knew what he was supposed to do this with this thing about cooking it in the end, but to be safe, wanted to know if I might have any other sources that were a little bit more explicit about what, what you were supposed to do with this stuff. So there were a number of options we could have gone with, uh, but this is uh, the one that I settled on. This is the Philadelphia cookbook. It's from a few decades after 
Mrs. Beaton. This was written in 1886 by Mrs. Sarah Tyson Heston Rohrer. She was the principal of the Philadelphia Cooking School, and it's getting a little bit closer, it's getting a lot closer actually, to how we think of recipes in a cookbook being today. So she has a lot of the same a lot of the same recipes, a lot of the same ideas as Mrs. Beaton, but she's quite a bit more explicit um, and just writes it quite a bit more like we're used to and like we would uh, expect a recipe and find it uh, possible to relate to and recreate ourselves today. Her parallel to the recipe that Chris is trying to recreate, uh, she's calling oyster filling for poultry. Uh, and she puts actually at the top of the recipe that this is good for a, a 16 pound turkey. Uh, so the next thing I did was turn to her section on, on roasting stuffed turkeys. And while she doesn't spell out the process for the, um, for the oyster stuffing specifically. She has several other stuffings uh, for turkey that would have been used in place of the oyster stuffing. Uh, and she's very clear, very explicit that the turkey is to be stuffed uh, with the stuffing, st stuffing prior to it being cooked, prior to it going in the oven, uh, that it, and that it is cooked in the bird that way. This is to be baked in a quick oven, probably no less than 425 degrees, and uh, you're to put it on top of bacon, actually, then with some water in the bottom of the pan, and baste it every 10 minutes, except for the last 15 minutes, when you should baste it with butter and then dredge flour over it. So this oyster stuffing was not a uh, strange concept uh, in the 19th 19th century, so there are a lot of sources that we could have cross-referenced, but for my money, I find Mrs. Rohrer's work uh, to be almost always a surefire bet uh, to adding some uh, precision to your uh, interpretation of recipes in the mid to late 19th century. So I hope that helps, and thanks for calling, Chris. Thanks, Brian. So now that I know the dressing was meant to be stuffed in a bird and cooked all together, I think I could take some liberties and bake this stuffing in the oven just like its modern counterpart. Let's get started. For this recipe, you will need six fresh or canned oysters, I'm using fresh, four ounces or half cup of breadcrumb, and instead of something finer, like we would typically think when we think of breadcrumbs, I'm gonna be using small torn pieces of stale bread. Two ounces or four tablespoons of melted butter, one teaspoon of fresh chopped herbs, and I'm using parsley, thyme, and chives, a pinch of grated nutmeg, salt and pepper, and one egg. But for today, I think I might double the ingredients to have enough to share. Mrs. Beaton's recommends simmering the fresh oysters in its liqueur in a saucepan for 10 minutes. So let's go ahead and do that. But if you're using canned oysters, you can actually skip this step. While that's on the stove simmering, I'm actually going to take my stale French bread and start breaking it up into smaller, more manageable pieces. And I'm using French bread today, but you can use sourdough bread or any other kind of stale bread that you might have on hand. Now that the oysters have cooked, it's time to drain them, but we want to make sure that we actually reserve the liquid. So I'm going to take a bowl, set it in the sink, and put a strainer over it, find some mesh seed over top of that, and we're just going to strain our simmered oysters and reserve that liqueur that it was simmering in. I'm also going to go ahead and put our butter in a saucepan and melt that down. I've already chopped up my fresh herbs, I've already gotten my bread ready, but I need to clear out the cutting board so that way I can chop the oysters. So I'm going to actually move ahead a little bit in my steps and go ahead and put the fresh herbs over top of my bread just so I can clear up my cutting board. And it's okay to move these steps around because it's all gonna get incorporated at the very end anyway. So now that we've cleared out the cutting board, I'm going to go ahead and take my oysters and set them onto the cutting board and just give them a nice rough chop. It doesn't have to be perfect. Now that I've got my oysters chopped, I'm going to take another bowl 
with my two eggs, crack them, and just give them a whisk until they are all liquefied. So, now that we've got all of our ingredients together, we're gonna go ahead and take our chopped oysters and go ahead and put those right into our breadcrumb mixture. I'm gonna go ahead and take our egg and just pour that over the top. Then, with a microplane and your nutmeg, you're just going to very carefully grate some fresh nutmeg over the top, add our melted butter into this mixture as well, season it with a little bit of salt and pepper, and give it a stir, just to get everything fully combined and incorporated. Now it's at this point, if you feel as though it's not combined fully or you need a little bit of liquid to help bring it all together. You can actually use your reserved oyster liqueur that you simmered the oysters in and just add just add as much as you think that you might need to get it all nice and combined. And once you have everything combined, it's time to put it in a buttered dish. Um, and you can use your leftover stick uh, of butter to butter the inside of your casserole dish. I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna actually use pan cooking spray. Don't tell anybody. Very carefully pour our stuffing into our baking dish. Make sure you get all those fresh herbs out of your bowl. Now this goes into a 350 degree oven for about 40 to 45 minutes until hot and golden brown. So we'll see you in about 40 minutes. Timer's just gone off on the stuffing, so it's time to pull it out of the oven and give it a taste. So this is what it looks like just out of the oven. See that it's got a nice golden brown finish on the top. Really, really good. You get the bold flavors from the oysters kind of all mixed in. Uh, and putting a little bit of that oyster liqueur in the overall stuffing mixture before we baked it really helped. And then the fresh herbs just give it that nice punch. So I hope you've enjoyed cooking uh, this oyster dressing with me today. And I really hope that you decide to head out to your local grocery store, buy the ingredients to make your own oyster stuffing a la the 1900s. If you do decide to make your own oyster dressing, uh, by using this particular recipe that we used out of Mrs. Beaton's, feel free to tag the Conrad Cobble House Museum in, uh, in a post. Show us your pictures of your own oyster dressing. We'd love to see it. Thanks and have a happy Thanksgiving. I'm going to get more of this. That's so good. You can't have any.